Well, good morning, Lambrick. Scott here. Welcome to 2021. Uh, January 3rd, good to be together. Uh, I expect many of us are still kind of like preparing our hearts for and our selves, our thoughts, everything for kicking into a new year starting tomorrow. Um, so this morning is going to be really simple. I'm kind of inviting you into... Um, yeah, something different this morning, and uh, yeah, uh, let me just get us connected with a few announcements. So, uh, normally, we um, through the month of Je December have our Advent project, we typically carry that through into the new year for a brief moment. So, I do want to put that out there if anyone still wants to give towards our uh, Advent project, which was towards missions in need. So, any of our partners that are in that we are aware of in places of critical need. Um, but also specifically focusing the bulk of our giving towards our partners in Calcutta, India with Mahima Holmes, uh, who have been grieving this year the loss of Samita Singh, their director, and the death of the wife of their executive director of the larger organization, the JKPS Ministry. And they're seeking to bring together their scattered homes that are that exist uh, for the care, the restoration, uh, the support of women and children who've been rescued from human trafficking, and to bring their separate buildings together into one uh, a new home that will be the core of the organization called the Samita Singh Memorial House. And we're looking forward to um, giving towards that all the, the bulk of our Advent project. So if you still want to give towards that, you can. The door is open. Um, also, I just want to give you a heads up for what's coming this month. Many of you will know that I normally take a pause in the month of January. Uh, it's a bit of a, of a study pause. Um, I'm still on deck. I'm still around. I'm still leading, pastoring. But I will take all of my study and uh, preaching work time towards deep, deep study and extended prayer for what's coming this year. I've done that for the last number of years. It's helped me have a little bit of mental space and prayer space and uh, dig deep for what's coming. So um, th that does mean this month we've got some great guests coming. So I'm, I'm excited for that. Next Sunday, we'll have Brian Bueller, a friend, pastor, mentor of mine. He actually, some of you will remember him. He spoke on the evening of my commissioning. He's been quoted many times, and he's a wonderful um, alliance, lifetime alliance pastor. The following week, we'll have Chris Lane, all the way from the UK. Chris is a friend and mentor, significant mentor of uh, Lucy. Um, I've been reading Lu uh, Chris's book over this Christmas, hugely been blessed by his uh, work as an inner city church planter in a, su uh, a community within uh, the greater Manchester area. Um, in Salford, uh, Langworthy, and I was glad to have him coming to share with us from across the globe. Uh, the following week, we'll have Jason Kovacs, uh, who lives on the mainland and is an old friend of mine, but really, he's actually a wonderful Christian and my counselor, and uh, I've asked him to share something with us. And then the last week of the month, we have Carissa Youssef, who is from uh, Food for the Hungry Canada, our partners that we're partnered with in Western Ethiopia, and we're really excited to have Carissa come and speak. So that's a bit of what's coming this month. Uh, one more thing, but I'll talk about that after we pray. So settle in, friends. Let's pray together as we begin. Living God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Thank you for this day. Thank you for a new year. Thank you that you are in every day with us. All that has gone beyond uh, before us, all that we have walked through, and you are going to be in the coming days with us, God. Thank you for last Sunday and Steve Brown and his uh, wonderful leadership to us, helping us reflect on the year and poise our hearts towards stepping into this year with faith and trust as we look into this year, God, we, we just say together, we so need you. We need your grace, your mercy. We need faith. 
hope, love to lead us, God, to lead us forward as a community and as individuals. So we just give you one another. Uh, for those of us, um, well, for all of us, God, as we step into the coming days, would you breathe upon us by your grace through your word? Lord, we ask that our reflection this morning on Psalm 86, verse 11, would be uh, a part of your invitation for us and be a prayer that gets planted deep in our hearts. So guide us now. Guide me, God, as I bring together the things that I have been studying and praying and reflecting on as we look into this year. Take this time and make it a part of your ministry among us. Amen. All right, so... um, yeah, we start this year. I want to uh, put in front of us something we've been talking about over this last month. Uh, you may have seen the notes, uh, videos that Lucy and I have made, announcements about something called the Shema Project. Um, you can go online and find it on our website. There is a, a packet that guides us and invites us into the Shema Project. A Shema is a Hebrew word. It means listen. It means hear. And... Uh, It's a very significant word throughout the biblical story. If our God is a God who speaks, then our call is to listen. We spend this fall talking about hearing God's voice, the invitation of God to listen and hear his voice. In the Jewish tradition, the the Shema refers to specifically one passage of scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and following. Many of us know this text. Uh, It's it's a famous uh, prayer that Jews pray every day. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Hear, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. This is a text that Jesus picks up when he's asked, What is the greatest commandment? And I love that this is what the Shema is. Shema means hear, listen, and yet this text that begins with this word Shema names for us the goal of Shema, the goal of our listening, that we would love God with all we are, with all that we have, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And so we're calling this initiative the Shema Project as an invitation from here till Easter, 13 weeks to go on a journey together of reading scripture on a regular basis, daily basis, and there's a guide for that. That's what this really is. And then also engaging together, locking arms with one or maybe a huddle of others, engaging together with what God is saying to us in scripture as we seek to grow as people who listen. So consider today your invitation to enter into and be a part of the Shema Project in the coming season. Could be kind of like a New Year's resolution, but it's more than that. It's something we're giving you um, a a guide to help us walk in this. We're inviting us to commit to this together, and I I trust that God could do something amazing in many of us through this, just like Rooted uh, caused, it was a catalyst to some really significant growth in Christ a few years back. I hope that the Shema Project will be that for us too. And it starts this week, uh, as you, if you were to open it up and get through the introduction, the explanation, the first week of the Shema Project is actually not daily reading, but an invitation to memorize one verse in the Bible, um, Psalm 86, verse 11. It's actually what I have written on the whiteboard beside me here, the flip term. And so this morning, I want to just share some observations, reflections that I've had on this psalm as I have spent some time praying it, studying it, memorizing it, writing it out, um, typing it out on my computer, and just living with this, this verse, which I'm inviting, we're inviting you to live in this week and take as our prayer as we step into the Shema Project together. So the verse reads, I'm reading from the NRSV translation, and maybe I'll reference it later on why. It says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I'll read that again. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I'll be honest, I committed to Kenzie to make this morning short, and the more I've lived with this uh, this verse and this psalm, the more I've 
longed for an opportunity to really preach it. I think I could spend a few Sundays on this Psalm one day. There's so much in it. Um, it's really been amazing. And I, that's not just preacher talk. It really has been a beautiful gift to sit with this Psalm to memorize this prayer. Um, so let me just, but I'm just going to lay out some observations and make today more of a launch pad, an invitation into a journey that we all get to go on. And then I'm going to share one song uh, that I wrote earlier this year, a prayer I've been praying a lot this year that I don't think I've shared, and that will be the morning. So let me make sure I've missed, not missed anything else. I think that's it. All right. Well, oh, there's my water. Thank you. All right. So, so a, a couple observations about this psalm, Psalm 86. Um, I'll show you for me. When I'm memorizing something, I write it out. So I actually wrote out the whole psalm, um, even though we're just invited to, to st study and memorize verse 11. That's right there. I actually wrote out the whole thing just to help me engage with it. Doing so helps me kind of notice repeated words, repeated themes. Um, the psalm begins, it says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I call all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. So give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. Uh, those are just the first seven verses. There's actually 17 verses, but we'll, we'll stop there for now. So a few observations. First of all, this is a Psalm of David, which I was a little surprised as I leaned into that. I, I thought, okay, what does that mean? What's the significance of that? There's 151 Psalms. There's actually only two Psalms in the whole of the Psalter that are referred to as so, a psalm of David. Now, there's loads of psalms that say of David, but there's only two psalms in the whole of the 151 psalms that say a, a psalm of, oh, sorry, a prayer of David. Oh, let me clarify. Yes, a psalm of David, a psalm of David, a psalm of David. That's what it is. Uh, there's only two. This psalm, Psalm 86 and Psalm 17. Now, there's all these other psalms that say of David, and I, I can't really parse out you a great significance of what the difference is, except that I think many uh, students of the psalms would say that there is a unique way in which we just have confidence that these emerge from the story, the earthy lived experience of David, the king of Israel, um, shepherd in the fields, servant of God, a psalm of David. Second observation, um, as you heard as I read the start of this psalm, uh, this psalm is, is an unfamiliar psalm, but it's filled with familiar prayers all throughout it, almost like stock prayers, right? Like if you're making a PowerPoint, sometimes you just go to Unsplash or whatever and you pull photos, stock photos. This prayer is full of kind of stock prayers. Um, give ear to my voice. Preserve my life. Um, be gracious to me, Lord. All these things that we're really familiar with, which can kind of make it feel generic. And yet there's something about, I think it's worth us acknowledging, the gift of stock prayers. Um, the gift that, that or the, re recognizing that there's times where we don't know what to pray for. Our heart doesn't have language, maybe. Something's not burning for us. And sometimes it's the prayer of others. It's prayers we've overheard from others, maybe in the sanctuary as the psalmist had, or for us at church, or from another that gets us praying, invites us down a path into prayer. And that's what we hear in this psalm. It has some carrying over of the prayers of others as the psalmist starts to give language to their own experience. So stock prayers, familiar prayers, nothing wrong with running on the tracks of another as we find language for our own experience, longing, need. Third, this psalm, I would call this psalm a wandering prayer. Uh, there's a lot of psalms that fit into specific genres. So lament psalms, praise psalms, petition psalms, royal psalms. This psalm is just kind of a run-of-the-mill normal prayer psalm. It's a wandering 
psalm. It doesn't have just a simple movement from, I cry out, you answer me. It moves, it wanders, like our thoughts often wander. Uh, It moves from need to trust, to petitioning, to praise, to naming his predicament, to declaring God's goodness, to a plea at the end. It wanders all over the map. And I love the example of a psalm like this, a wandering prayer psalm, because it gives us permission. It gives us permission to pray as we are, to not feel like we need to script a prayer that has a specific goal and trajectory. It's honed. It has maybe three points. No, we just bring ourselves to God and prayer can wander with God, with God, not just to God. Okay, so it's a Psalm of David, familiar prayers, a wandering prayer. Fourth, um, in verse 14, the psalmist actually does name his partic- his or her particular predicament. Um, it says, verse 14, O God, the insolent rise up against me. A band of ruffians seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. So early in the psalm, the psalmist cries out, but kind of in a generic way. But here in verse 14, there's this naming of the specific situation, the particular predicament of the psalmist. The psalmist feels attacked, threatened by others. Just want us to know that. All right, we're coming, we're honing in towards verse 11. That's the focus for this morning. But maybe with it, that fourth comment, the predicament, leads us into the fifth, which is, This psalm highlights for us that prayer is what happens when two things collide in our lives. Um, Oh, I've got these points here. Oh, we talked, my goodness, the Psalm of David. Sorry about that. Familiar prayers, wandering prayer, the the insolent rise up against us. Oh, this is why I have this here. We're not going to repeat this. We don't have to start again. I'll stick with it, okay? So this fifth point is... The prayer happens when we acknowledge. I know you can't read this, but it helps me. It says, I'm not okay and everything is not good. And I I appreciate that so much about the Psalms, how they invite us to acknowledge, I'm not okay and everything is not good. And when that is coupled together with this, some sort of glimpse, experience, memory that God is good. When those two things come together, prayer comes out of our hearts toward God, right? Not just when life is hard, but when life is hard and we know that there's a God who is listening, who cares, and who acts, has acted, is known for having acted. Maybe we don't feel it right now, but we know that our God is a God who responds to the cries of the broken. That's the story of Scripture. Out of that, we pray. And this psalm invites us to name that, to say, maybe today, Things are not all good. I'm not doing well. But you, God, are good. And to you, I cry. All right, so those are the introductory uh, thoughts as we come to verse 11. I'll read it for us again. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. This is the verse we want to invite us to memorize this week, to come back to each day this week, to maybe write down and put in our pocket and carry with us, to take a photo of or a screenshot and carry it with us and come back to it. That's what I've been doing this week, helping me um, pray this prayer. And as you pray it, as you memorize it, you find yourself saying, okay, teach me your your way, O Lord, uh, that I may know, that I may may walk in. I may walk in your truth. So it starts with these words, teach me your way. Uh, This is such a good prayer for us as we embark into this year, as we enter into the Shema project, but as we just seek to live, because this is the starting point of listening to God, of being a person who listens to God's voice, this conviction that I have something to learn and God is the one who knows all things, that God has so much to teach me and us. I don't know it all, neither do you, and so we pray, teach me your way. It only makes sense, really, as we step into this journey 
of listening to God this year, whether that's through the Shema Project or whatever it is that is guiding you as you seek to listen to God as we come together Sunday after Sunday and study God's Word as we engage in conversation about how God would have us follow Him as His people at the heart of it, the foundation of it, needs to be this prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord. We want to know and follow your way. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. I want you to notice how the psalmist connects God's ways and God's truth. My computer just went to sleep. Let me make sure we're still going. Okay. Uh, Notice how the psalmist connects God's ways and God's truth. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. It feels a bit odd. It could feel a bit odd. We don't always necessarily think of those as, as united things, God's truth and God's ways. Until we realize that the God we're talking to, the God we're praying to, is not just omnipresent, omniscient, omni-whatever, but this is a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, as God reveals himself in Revelation, or sorry, Exodus 34, and as this psalm references to us, which we'll come to in a minute. Israel's God is not just the true God, but the truth about this God is known in his character. The Lord, Yahweh, is known by his character, his ways. In other words, the way God is toward me, the way God is toward you, the way that God is toward all. Again, as Exodus 34, as God reveals there, he says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. And because of this, knowing God, knowing this God, means knowing and walking in God's ways. That's what this first part of the prayer teaches us. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. It's a prayer we need. It's a prayer I need as we step into this year. God, not just I want to understand you, but I want to know you. And I want my knowing of you to shape and lead and transform how I live, how I walk. That my journey, my my faith lived out in front of my son, my daughter, and my wife, and my neighbors, and my church, and the world would be evidence of who you are. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. I love that. So I've been living with that, that opening part of this verse. But there's a second half, and I love it. This is actually the part that surprised me. It's amazing how memorizing scripture makes you alert, opens you up to um, parts of the text that you just haven't paid attention to, parts that maybe struck you before as irrelevant, as just stock prayers, meaningless, kind of religious language. But as you live with it, you find yourself caught that it matters so much. It's so real. And this part, I feel that. It says, the psalmist invites us to pray, give me an undivided heart. Give me an undivided heart. I wonder how those words catch you. The more I have prayed them, the more I've thought about this prayer, give me an undivided heart, the more I've resonated with the implication here that apart from grace, my heart is divided, fragmented, turning in different directions, pulling in different, maybe even opposing directions. How often, if if I'm honest, how often do I find my heart pulling in different directions? And so I need this prayer. Give me an undivided heart. The Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, affirms, it says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and all of your soul and all of your strength. And when Jesus quotes it, he adds, and all of your mind. That's the vision of life with God. That's the vision of what it means to be truly saved, truly alive in God, that we would become, that we would be people whose hearts, that's the core of our being, would be one, 
not divided, not pulling in multiple directions, but united with God, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, in love for God and neighbor. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Some translations say to fear your name, not cower, but honor, revere, which points us again, the word name there, right? It's not just to revere the name that you are called, but in the Old Testament to refer to God's name or someone's name was to refer to their reputation, their character, their ways. See the connection here to other parts of this psalm. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. Give me an undivided divided heart to revere your name. Which leads us to our last point, okay? I, this is the short, I, it's not even a sermon. Uh, my last point here. Uh, this psalm, this is one of the discoveries for me as I've lived with this psalm as a whole. At three points, so at verse 5, verse 11, our core scripture text, and verse 15, they all point us towards another part of scripture, and that is Exodus 34, verses 6 and following, the revelation of God's name. Uh, That passage, I've already quoted it, where God says to Moses, he says, God, show me your glory. He says, okay, I will. And he passes by God and he declares his name. He says, I'll tell you my name, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And that, that text, that revelation is quoted three times in this very psalm. This is God's name, God's character, uh, we, yeah, I love this. And, and the thing I want to drive home right now for us, how amazing it is that this psalm and this verse point us towards this other verse is it tells us this week as we are invited to memorize and meditate on a prayer written by an ancient psalmist, that psalmist themselves, they were memorizing, had memorized and meditated on another ancient prayer, Exodus 34, verses 6 and following. And that prayer, that revelation, Exodus 34, anchored the psalmist in their crisis, in their place of need, just as we are seeking to people, be a people who meditate on, even memorize God's word, so that when we find ourselves divided, attacked, in place of crisis, we would find ourselves held together, if not restored by God. There's so much more I could say about this verse. I hope one day to do a whole series on Exodus 34, verses 6 and following. But what matters for us today, as we step into this year, and as many of us dig into the Shema project together, is that our prayer for God to teach us, for God to reveal his truth to us, needs to be wedded to a pursuit of seeking to listen. Right? As we say today, as we look into this year, we say, teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. That that prayer leads us into the practice of listening as the psalmist in Psalm 86 himself or herself sought to listen, to be a listener, to meditate on God's revelation all right, that's it. I'm just throwing out some, some um, anchor points, some of my own observations as you, many of us, step into memorizing Psalm 86 verse 11 this week. So whether right now you feel like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump into the Shema project. Maybe you're not. Maybe you have some other study that you're planning on giving yourself to, committing to with friends. That's fine. You, you, I want it, whatever you do, as long as you're pursuing Jesus, as long as you, we are seeking to be people who lean in and listen for God's voice as a regular part of our lives, that's what matters most. That's what Shema is all about, whether or not you use this Bible reading plan is kind of secondary, though it would be amazing if a whole community of us, young and old, uh, picked it up, downloaded it, or went to it on the website and use it as a guide for us in reading scripture in the coming season, all the way from here till Easter. But no matter what, I want to invite us to take this prayer today and this week, 
Teach me your way, O Lord, that I, might, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. All right, I'm going to push this back. And grab my guitar. And share with you a song that I wrote um, about a year ago, probably been honing it over this year, comes out of a book I read a year ago, uh, November and December last year, 2019, um, a book by Peter Grieg. He's an international leader of the, a prayer movement called the 24-7 Prayer Movement Community, and um, he has a, a daily uh, scripture reading and prayer blog uh, or app called Lectio uh, 365. Uh, which is awesome. I know some of us use it. Um, but in it, he talked about St. Francis, uh, one of God's people who had this prayer that was a centering prayer in his life, that was an anchoring prayer. And it was simply this. He said, he prayed, he'd come to God and to still his mind, he would say, my God and my all, my God and my all, my God and my all. And that prayer, that, that phrase, that simple, those five words would help settle his soul, turn his heart towards God as he began into his day or came away from the chaos or in the midst of, of all things to just orient his heart towards God and also name his, his, the truth and his goal that his life would be all in and for and with God, my God, and my all. And so that, I started praying that. Um, and this song and the prayer of it kind of took shape. Simple. Might get changed still. We'll see. I'm not ready to record it, so, but I'll share it with you. So. My God and my all My God and my all
give you my soul all of my mind and my strength I give you my joy and my ache all of my hope and my pain my God and my all my God in my home, my God in my home, my God in my home. Let me pray us out and pray us into this year. Teach us, O oh Lord, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, Yahweh, you who are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Teach us, O oh Lord. Teach us your mercy and your grace. Teach us, as your name reveals to us, who you are toward us all the time, including right now, no matter who we are or what we've done, no matter what the last day, night, week, year has been, you are toward us, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Teach us, O oh Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Oh God, may your grace lead us forward and Open our hearts up to your revelation in a way that would reclaim and renew, that would guide us in repentance, rethinking our lives in the light of your mercy and grace, being caught up in your character, your ways, that we may walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts. Oh God, we confess to you how often, how how often, how easily our heart both turns toward you and runs away, seeks our own pleasure over your glory, seeks our desires, not your will, your kingdom. Give us an undivided heart. God, make us hungry, desperate for your gospel to claim our lives, for your grace and mercy to be our story this year, God for us and for others. Teach us your way, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts to revere your name. God, that by your grace, by the mystery of your grace, somehow our lives would become the canvas upon which you would uh, paint your masterpiece. You would reveal your glory, your character, your goodness in everyday, ordinary ways through us, God, for your glory, in miraculous, surprising ways, God, for your glory this year. Give us ears to hear your voice and make us hungry to listen. This year, this week, meet us in this psalm, meet us in this verse, make it our prayer, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go in peace, friends. Welcome to 2021. God is with us, and he is waiting to meet us and lead us in the coming days. Go in Christ. In himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is here with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior.